2005. May I was 20 years old at the time. Anniversary, so to speak. And the money from gifts from my parents and relatives was not enough even for a third of my present. I had just passed my driver's license and wanted to buy a car. A used car, but a car. My parents lived from paycheck to paycheck. They barely had enough money for clothes. So my young mind thought of nothing better than to get a part-time job. For a long time I went and asked acquaintances about possible jobs, but except for a promoter, I was not offered anything. Well, consider this. Standing on the street in full view of everyone, calling people to some store and simply put to be some clown for two dollars an hour. It's too little. Especially to buy a car would have to work in this way for about a year. But fortunately, my brother's friend needed a security guard at some hospital. Guarding a hospital was nothing and the pay was good. The next day, I went to the hospital to get settled in. I was unpleasantly surprised to learn that it was a hospital for the mentally ill, but I didn't pay much attention to it. There was no interview, they said. Here's the baton. No patients allowed. Call 911. I nodded and showed my interest. Nothing much happened all day at work. Only occasionally men would come up and ask for a smoke, but no one was allowed out. There was only one cleaning lady and a couple of doctors. When they saw me, they all left without a word. What could I take from them? Poor people, working around the clock with crazy people. Well, the clock struck 12. I had a whole night of shows and movies to entertain myself. I turned the TV on low volume and prepared to be entertained, but suddenly, I heard an eerie scream from the lower floors. I turned off the sound. I quickly rushed to the door where the scream was coming from, put my ear to the door. The screams and pleas for help continued. I started banging and pounding on the door. And then I was seized with a wild terror. There was a white hand on my shoulder. It was slowly squeezing my shoulder. I quickly turned around. It was the hand of the cleaning lady. She was whispering softly. This is the hopeless room where they take those who can't be cured. They throw them leftovers or just raw meat, breadcrumbs, unopened juices and compotes. When I first started working here, I was told that the cook who brought the food accidentally went in there. The door slammed behind him, and he was never seen again. The cleaning lady silently handed me earplugs. I took them and went to my post. I sat and stared at one point. I felt uneasy, and I slowly fell asleep. I woke up only to a short knock on the door. Slowly turning my head, I saw a young girl on the threshold who smiled at me embarrassedly. It was nine o'clock in the morning. I opened the door. She politely greeted me, handed me a hot paper bag, and told me it was the usual, big tasty fries and Coca-Cola without ice. A little later, I realized it was a past security guard who had ordered lunch from a cafe in the same building. I decided not to deviate from the guard's tradition and took those lunches. They weren't that expensive. The burger with butter and fries smelled so good. I didn't like the meat in it, but it was better than nothing. The second day went by without me noticing. The only thing I noticed was that new people were placed in the hopeless room. And around one in the afternoon, a huge cart with some red containers drove into the room, which were then reloaded into a truck and taken away from here. I think they might have been used tools or dirty clothes going to the dry cleaners. It seemed odd to me, but who knows what the rules are. I'm just a security guard after all. 
I decided not to share my observations with anyone. Night fell quietly. I turned on the TV, but there was nothing but static on the screen. I decided to just sit and watch the night guests. Suddenly, I heard cries for help from downstairs again. I tensed up a bit and started listening to the voices. And I heard a woman's voice. She was screaming and begging for mercy. Then I heard a man's voice. Shut up! There's no one here to help you! And something buzzed. I was shocked. It didn't sound like the speech of a sick person. So I decided to check what was going on. After making sure the front door was closed, I headed into that unfortunate room. The screams were getting quieter and quieter, and the rumbling was getting louder and louder. Making sure there was no one behind me, I slowly opened the door. I had never seen anything like this in my life. There was a cell in the basement with people lying in it, tables red with blued and red colored containers next to them. There were men and women lying on the tables and people in robies were leaning over them and slowly cutting them up. The pieces were put into containers. I almost threw up. I quickly slammed the door shut and ran to my post. I grabbed my baton and sat down, watching every corner of the corridor. The whole next day, I couldn't find myself wondering what these people were and why there were so many deaths from them. I remembered that these red containers were being loaded into some large truck. The day came, the truck arrived, and I decided to follow it. When the truck was loaded, I followed where it would go. All of a sudden, it stopped at the end of this house. Oh, shit. Right in front of an apartment building and a coffee shop. The containers were hurriedly dragged into the building and the truck drove off. At that moment, a strange thought occurred to me. Why would some fast food restaurant need bags from a mental institution? There were too many questions surrounding this house for me to sit idly by. I was determined to get to the bottom of this shit. Throughout the day, I watched the actions of the entire staff, getting to know each doctor and seeing how often they reviewed the general file. And there was one. Her name was Victoria Brown. She visited the archives about three times a day. I knew that was where the documents and records I needed were kept. I went to the drugstore across the street and bought some laxatives and then called Victoria in for tea, so to speak, to get to know her better. I poured a horse dose of the medicine into her cup and I was sure that the toilet would replace her archives for the next few days. Seizing the opportunity, I snuck into that room and found a folder with the clinic's contracts with other organizations. After studying the documents for about half an hour, I was horrified when the picture finally became clear in my eyes. At one time, this clinic had too many patients, if I may say so, and there was nowhere to put them. The owner of the clinic decided to pull a terrible scheme. He deliberately undermined the psyche of healthy people with hypnosis and videotapes. Then he sent them to a ward for the hopeless. And since such people were of no use to the state or their families, they were cut up for meat. And later, he signed a contract with the very restaurant where the human meat was delivered. The customers didn't even know what they were eating, and the owner of the kefi benefited from it because he bought it for nothing, and the burgers and steaks were very popular among the customers. After that, I didn't take the money promised for a week's work as a security guard and left the building. And tried never to think about it again. And sometime later, this hospital was closed because of inappropriate behavior with patients. All those involved were put in jail. But this cafe is still popular with young people. The only question is, what kind of meat do they cook? and where do they get it from? <laughs>